All right, there we go. Testing, testing. Everybody ready? I feel like we're going through disrupted sites. It's an appropriate, uh, appropriate title for our discussion with all the disruption this morning, right? Y'all can laugh at that. Don't be shy. All right, we're going to get it rolling. My name is Happy Johnson. I'm the Coastal Louisiana Organizer for the National Wildlife Federation. We, um, we are one of the largest environmental organizations in the country. We have about 4 million members. We've been involved in coastal restoration efforts here in the state of Louisiana since 2006. Most people probably know the National Wildlife Federation by Ranger Rick. Everybody remember the, the Ranger Rick magazine as a kid probably? Uh, here we play a, a role on the state's uh, framework development team in terms of helping develop the state's comprehensive coastal master plan. We were also very active in helping Congress pass the Restore Act, which uh, would help get funds from the BP oil spill fines that come down to the five Gulf Coast states to help communities rebuild after the BP oil spill and after hurricanes. The title of this panel is Losing Ground, Disappearing Coastlines in Urban Centers. Louisiana is ground zero for land loss, both literally and figuratively. We have the highest rate of coastal disappearance in the nation. When you put the, the past seven years in context, you think about hurricanes Katrina, Rita, Gustav, Ike, and Isaac. You think about the great economic recession. You think about in our city, you think about crime and youth violence. You think about the BP oil spill. And then you think about a a disrupted fishing community, a, a, a group of folks that um, see their entire livelihood disrupted by these natural disasters, by these economic disasters, uh, and by these environmental disasters. And so this panel is to address um, some of those issues uh, within the context of coastal restoration, youth, the future economy, jobs, uh, and how Louisiana can kind of be at the forefront of creating a resilient curriculum almost for the rest of the nation. Our panel, we have a great list of panelists. Um, first up is Reverend Tyrone Edwards. He is the president of the Zion Travelers Cooperative in Phoenix, which is in Plaquemines Parish. After that, we'll have Dr. Arthea Nance from the University of New Orleans. We'll have Charles Allen, who is the director of the mayor's Office of Environmental Affairs. And then Matilda Tennessee, who is the director of a youth program called Limitless Vistas. First up, we'll have Reverend Tyrone Edwards. We'll play a, a brief um, video that will introduce uh, his talk, which he'll explain the, the work that he does. And this uh, video is called Arise and Rebuild. The volume not on. Well, while they're getting the video together, um, I want to thank the folks that organized this forum and, and inviting um, me here tonight in an organization I work with called the Zion Travel Cooperative Center. And we operate out of Plaquemine Parish, the southeast end of Plaquemine Parish. Um, we call ourselves the big tour that slip out of the boot. We run into the Gulf of Mexico, so therefore, whenever there's a disaster, then we have to be concerned because most of the hurricanes take place in the Gulf of Mexico, so we're sort of like the gateway for most hurricanes um, that take place. 
And so when we look at the title of this forum called Disruptive Community, um, the sad thing about our community is that we're still in a state of recovery. And it's like we can't never get out of recovery, and we have to question why. So when I was hearing the designers and the engineers are talking, and one thing, I don't, we have a lot of experienced African-American designers. They're there, but they can't get no money for their project because of racism. So it is not because they don't have the skill that's needed. It's the fact that they're not getting the fund that's needed. They know the kind of things our community needs. So it has been clear to us since Hurricane Katrina that disaster is about dollars. It's no different than any other thing that happened in our lives. And so, and the folks that control the disaster are, are former congressmen, former military people, and they get all the money and every, most of the work that you see, you'll find out they're connected to that. And so we think there is a need for community engagement and a relationship because oftentimes African-American architects, while they might be good, they still have to understand because of racism, they're just a minority architect. They're just a minority designer. And we don't want to deal with that realism that takes place. In kind of racism alive and well. So we're saying it's a need for us to come together and be about rebuilding our community. And I'm not going to talk a lot about it because I have confidence in Chuck Allen. He's going to continue that process. So what we're involved with in Plaquemine Parish since Hurricane Isaac, and we still wasn't out of it Hurricane Katrina, is how we rebuild an African-American community, a people of color community, because we know people are not coming to us, because we don't have a lot to offer to them. In spite of our animated parish president, Billy Nungesser, we have over 500 families in our community that have been impacted by this disaster. That's out of their home. Don't know where they're going. And so we're working to get people back in. And, and how we did after Hurricane Katrina to rebuild new homes, uh, to renovate homes, is for us to come together with volunteer, electrician, carpenters, and those kind of, because our community can't afford that. This hurricane have taught us that the insurance company has got so vicious with people, it is unbelievable. So therefore, People are not getting the money. One guy said, man, I had $250,000 coverage, and they want to offer me $60,000. It is a crime to have those kind of things. So people don't know how to get back. If you got FEMA money and you didn't maintain two years of insurance, you can forget it. Uh, FEMA told people the most we can get you if you lost everything that you had is between $31,500 and $37,000. What are people to do? So we understand that we have to do for ourselves. And so we came together in our community and started to rebuild the process and we're trying to get people out of recovery. The recovery process is that you wait on the government to come in. The recovery process is about you wait on them to come tear down your house until that contract uh, got the contract. And so you have in DC and, and a place like that, somebody get a, $50 million contract, and by the time it gets to Plaque and Parrot, that local contractor, you know, might get a $100,000 contract. And so we're saying we have to get around that. So we're saying it's very important there's some policy that's in place in this country that prevent us from getting the kind of stuff we need. Lastly, what I want to talk about, there was a wall built that started at the beginning of Plaque and Parrot and went all the way through St. Bernard Parish. I'm a country boy, and uh, we just deal with some common sense stuff. And it is our belief that the people who designed and engineered that wall did not take in consideration that nature, that water, the force of water, it will move and it have to go somewhere. When you stop it, you ought to know where it's going. When you detour it, you ought to know where it's going. And we're saying, until somebody come up, and because I'm a religious person, I think Jesus himself helped to come convince me that when he designed that wall, did not take Plaquemine Paris and St. John Paris in place, and that water came in and destroyed those two communities. We had community of Plaquemine Paris have never, ever in the 60 years of my existence and the 87 years old of my mother's existence alive now have never received water, received it this time. And so we're saying that collectively, all of us have to change the policy in this country where more money is spent for contracting and coming to a project that will protect people. We just went through an election. 
And it sat in my heart this morning when I read one person put $54 million into the election. $54 million can build all kind of protection for, for the Gulf, Gulf Coast region. So we have to begin to look at where we are. So I just hope that all of us will get together and begin to make Congress to be more responsible, to make the mayors and the past president to be more responsible and make sure that our people get adequate protection. And I want to say to the engineers, I want to say to African Americans, don't give up on your fight. But you, had, you can't do this in a silo. You will not benefit unless there's some serious community engagement and relationship. So when we begin to start going to community saying, look, we can come with this, but we need your support. And so again, I'm sorry you can see the video, but with the video, we, we, you want to introduce, yeah, to introduce the video. that's good. Just know it, it introduce itself if okay. you play it. So again, thank you. I have to leave. I thought this forum was at, at 2 o'clock, and I have to really get back to Plaquemine Parish. So I will let this video end my presentation. And it's always good um, to be in among so many people. And again, Chuck and I had a conversation, so I know he's going to continue. See, the music should be playing now, so something is wrong. He refers to me as Chuck because he also knows my dad, who's a Chuck. I'm sorry. That's the Chuck Allen. Yeah. That's all right. <laughs> I'm a Chuck, too. <laughs> Proudly so. So anyway, the music is no all, problem. but what it does, you can see uh, the force of the wind and the water that came into Plaquemine Parish and inundated uh, communities again, and uh, it destroyed so many homes, like I say, we have over 700 families that have been displaced, and this is some actual footage of somebody getting in black and fire, showing the force of water coming in. And so that water came in, because hurricane, uh, even when we talk about levees, even the core had what's called a flood base elevation map. And, and I don't agree with the Paris government too many times, but one thing that they did that I thought was great, they did not adopt the flood-based elevation, but what it would say, it would force everybody rebuilding the building houses 15 feet off the ground. That's totally economically impossible for our community to really do, and also it takes the blame of the Corps of Engineers who should be responsible for giving us the kind of protection that we need. We found out that the wall did work, but it only worked for a certain segment of, of, of the state, a certain segment of the community, and the result of the wall was being helped it just took the whole community where people left New Orleans and places that went to St. John Parish, thought they were coming to high ground, and hit it was back with another Katrina. We let people who left St. Bernard and came to Plaquemine Parish, and they got destroyed. So again, so it's not about elevating houses, it's about coming up with the proper protection. And if we had the proper protection, you wouldn't have the kind of damage they had. So engineering and, 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 and things are good, but you gotta understand, we, because of racism, you can pay for engineer, any kind of engineer you want, and get the justification for it. And so I'm going, we're going to meet on Tuesday, where we're going to hear some rationalizing and justification, you know, justify that wall being built. But in our church, we always talk about how people testify a lot. And so there's a lot of testifying taking place in disasters to try to throw you off. And so we think it's very important. In this video, you'll see people like Ricky Jackson, and tower on to get other people come in to Plaquemine. And we want to help those people who have the means to elevate their, high, their houses up high. We're definitely for that. We're not against it. But we're saying that if you have a majority a district, a three or five district, where the majority of the people in that school, the kids on free and reduced lunch, you know they cannot build a house 15 feet off the ground. And we know that the state is not going to give that kind of money to certain communities. So, again, so we have organized with the Christian ministers, our community, gutting out houses, renovating houses. As we speak, we got people doing electrician work and putting in sheetrock, and that's what we did after Hurricane Katrina. Our little organization, we built about 14 houses. Another group came in and built another 60 houses based on our blueprint, where we built houses for our community um, that was uh, $40,000 because we got free contractors, the labor engineer, we got around some of the stuff. We're getting ready to do that same thing again because we know we have a responsibility but we still say the government have a responsibility. Again, thank you all for inviting us here, and I hope all of us get involved with bringing about the kind of policy that we need that will protect the whole state of Louisiana. Uh, and we hope that our brothers and sisters in New Jersey understand now when people ask us questions, 
why do you still live there? Mm -hmm. Are the people going to move from Staten Island now? Are they going to move from the places where they are? No, so all of us, because of global, uh, because of global warming and the climate okay, change in this country, we understand how serious that is, that all of us where we live is a place of disaster. So it's going to be incumbent upon all of us to be involved in the move to make sure that happens. Thanks again for your time, and thanks for having me here. Thank you very much. Next up, we'll have Dr. Athea Nance, a social scientist at the University of New Orleans, who will present toward equity, prioritizing vulnerable communities during climate change. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I hope the technology works. Um, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, a paper that I recently published with Dr. Beverly Wright in the Duke Law and uh, the Duke Forum for Law and Social Policy, and I have copies of the article on this table here. There are five or six copies if you want it. It can also be available uh, by download. The title of this article is "Toward Equity: Prioritizing Vulnerable Communities in Climate Change." Um, the idea of this paper is to use the experience of New Orleans, as well as the coast of Louisiana, as an example um, to reflect on the vulnerable communities, not only of our area, but around the entire globe in response to climate change. Um, and if there's anything I say or that's controversial or that, you know, if a question comes up, welcome please raise your hand, I'll answer it briefly and keep going. So here's my outline, I'm gonna go through this very quickly, I know I don't have too much time. Um, I'm gonna talk about, after I give you the statement of purpose, I'm gonna talk about the concepts of green development versus just development. These are concepts that are being used in the climate change debates. I'm also gonna talk about a little bit of uh, background about climate change, I'm sure a lot of people in the room are up to speed, but I'm just going to review a couple of things and talk about the energy transition that would be a part of adapting to climate change. And then I'm going to talk about vulnerability, environmental vulnerability, which is something that most communities of color, low-income communities, and disadvantaged communities experience. And then I'm going to get into the case and talk about some of the highlights of vulnerability um, that were experienced during the Katrina experience, levee failure and the Deepwater Horizon spill, and then talk about new strategies to move forward. So my purpose today is to reflect on local and global dimensions of inequity. And so I'm talking about the, the inequities faced by vulnerable communities who are at risk of climate change on top of already unacceptable baselines of existing risk. Okay, so we're gonna talk about it in a little more detail in a minute but basically a double and in some case triple threat that are posed by these types of communities. Um, let's see. So first con conceptually, the, the debate between green and just development. So green sustainability or the green agenda is another way that it's discussed, uh, is more of a mainstream way of thinking about how to deal with climate change, how to develop, and it basically looks at Minimizing impacts to future generations, also known as intergenerational equity. Things like um, green buildings, energy efficiency, uh, these are all within the green sustainability framework. The just sustainability framework, however, prioritizes existing vulnerable populations and attempts to mitigate or minimize negative impacts. Um, and so, Sometimes this just framework is included in a green framework, but sometimes it isn't. So if people are talking about sustainability, sustainable development, resilience, and they start talking on, around those lines and they're not including vulnerable populations specifically, then they're in that green sustainability framework. And I'm not saying that that exclusion is on purpose. It's an unconscious uh, oftentimes it's unconscious. And so there's an educational um, aspect to this that people who are conscious need to be including just sustainability at every, every uh, where that, it that it's uh, being excluded. 
Okay, climate change, as we all probably know, is caused by excess carbon in the atmosphere that results from the emission of natural and man-made greenhouse gases. Um, this triggers the greenhouse effect, which is warming of the atmosphere. The, there are specific types of gases that are known as greenhouse gases, or GHGs, um, and I've listed some of them there. The major sources of man-made greenhouse gases are the energy sector. Far and away, the biggest is the energy sector. Uh, but also the manufacturing sector, the forestry sector, and the agricultural sector. So a few things are necessary in order to mitigate and adapt to climate change. First is a reduction in the emission of greenhouse gases. Also a reduction in fossil fuel extraction, a reduction in fossil fuel-based transportation, and an increase in renewable, low GHG energy sources. Um, so the energy transition, all of those are energy-related activities. Energy transition is an important part of dealing with climate change, the, perhaps the largest uh, catastrophe, potentially catastrophic disaster that we're all going to be facing. Um, and these are not optional events. Uh, responding to climate change and going into an energy transition are not optional. We are, it's at our peril that we don't do it. And the costs of not doing it are catastrophic to our economy. Europe and China are already in their transition. They've begun. Um, there will be winners and losers even if we do a transition and start mitigating. Um, and those losers tend to be the vulnerable communities that we all care about and are, are of our concern. So the vulnerabilities that are specific to climate change, loss of life, loss of property, and we, have, we experience that every time we see a hurricane, you know, more frequent and, and stronger than before. Risk of hunger and water shortages. So that comes from the inability to grow food, having food shortages, and with increased droughts, having water shortages. Um, also an increased risk of coastal flooding, an increased risk of disease as tropical diseases move north because of the increase in climate, and a risk of forced migration where people are forced to leave places that they have called home for many years. And I, I, in hearing people talk today, even when, I think Diane had a, a nice example of forced migration that was because of a housing uh, a development gone wrong and people were literally ended up you know, being forced to migrate away from their homes. Um, so that's one way that vulnerable communities are forced to migrate, but they're also forced to migrate as a result of disaster and increasingly as a result of climate change. Now the pre-existing vulnerabilities that disadvantaged populations have, even before climate change, are things such as education gaps. If they don't have the education needed to get the green jobs, then those green jobs will not help them um, you know, to have enough money to buy food, to have housing and things that they'll need. So, so the education gap is, is, a, is a vulnerability. Um, they are at risk of poverty and hunger uh, today, even before we start talking about climate change. Their health is compromised from exposure to toxic chemicals. They tend to be more uh, located disproportionately in disaster-prone areas due to their poverty and because of discrimination. So briefly to talk a little bit about some of the uh, vulnerabilities that were created by the hurricane, Hurricane Katrina and the levee failure. First of all, this was a record-setting catastrophe. So this is on a, sh on a very short list of the worst of all of the catastrophes that we've experienced in this country. Um, it had disproportionate impacts, as we all saw, and resulted in forced migration of hundreds of thousands of people, and many of whom are still uh, displaced, uh, and brought up issues about whether people had the right to return or not. Um, this, it hit an area that was characterized by concentrated racialized poverty um, based on a history of exclusion, a history of discrimination that was intentional. Um, and this was exemplified by the public housing, uh, which was some of the worst in the country. Uh, but after the storm, the public housing remained closed for many, many months after the storm. Uh, the Department of Housing announced that it would be demolishing over half of all of the public housing units. Um, there were, uh, you know, there were marching in the street here about the public housing issue. Uh, because it, it, public housing was being closed at the same time, 
that the market conditions had increased the cost of rents, the cost of homes. So this, people felt locked out of coming back to their home. They felt like they couldn't come back. They felt like they didn't have the right to come back. So this was a huge issue. Um, now, it's also an issue that prior to that storm, the model of public housing was discriminatory. That's true. That was an intentional process. Um, and then some of the reasons that uh, HUD was using to demolish it was the, the realization, well, that was the past practice. It didn't work. We have a new idea now. Okay, but in the process of implementing that new idea, they hurt a lot of people. Okay, thanks. So that transition from uh, that, you know, and moving into a better public housing situation wasn't handled well. And so the purpose of bringing this up is to understand what that issue was from the perspective of vulnerable communities so that, you know, next time it could be remedied. Um, so we talk, talking about inequitable recovery uh, in terms of preventing or slowing rebuilding in predominantly low-income neighborhoods. And uh, there's some uh, data and statistics in the paper on this topic. Also plans to distribute recovery funds to the least storm-damaged areas. And today we see parts of the city recovered. Some parts are uh, continue to be not recovered. They continue to be urban food deserts. And so we don't have any equity principles in place for our recovery. Uh, let me skip to the Deepwater Horizon disaster. Here we have disproportionate exposure to the oil spill um, by native and small-scale coastal fishing communities, the communities that Reverend Edwards was talking about. Um, we also see racial disparities in the siting of waste facilities and disproportionate exposure to communities of color who live in, in the areas where the waste disposal facilities are. And so the majority of the oil spill waste, I know this has not been reported, but most of that waste is disposed in communities of color. So there's continuing disparities. Um, so we need new strategies to address simultaneous threats to vulnerable communities who are already a, in, you know, going through threats now and on top of that will have additional threats uh, resulting from climate change. We need new discourses that genuinely prioritize disadvantaged people. Um, and so I'm proposing here the climate justice discourse, which is uh, very interesting. Uh, since the year 2000 has been a growing and emerging discourse that sees climate change as a human rights issue. Um, here are some of the quotes from this strategy. Communities in the Global South, as well as low-income communities in the industrialized North, have borne the toxic burden of fossil fuel extraction, transportation, and production. Now these communities are facing the worst impacts of climate change, from food shortages to the inundation of whole island nations. Climate justice works to expose the false solutions to the climate crisis promoted by governments, financial institutions, and multinational corporations, such as trade liberalization, privatization, forest carbon markets, agrofuels, also known as bio biofuels, and carbon offsetting. So it's important for all of us to understand when a solution that's proposed as part of the green sustainability agenda, and the word false solution, is, is it, it can be called a false solution because it might help one aspect of society while it continues to hurt the vulnerable. So that's the main point of this paper, and I'm gonna stop it right there. Thank you very much. Can we talk after? Sure. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I ran out of time. <laughs> Thank you for this opportunity to come before you this morning. And I think that <clears throat> the foundation laid by Reverend Edwards and Dr. Nance um, was just the perfect springboard for me to kind of bring you down the path and into the story of a situation that I was very intimately involved in. Okay post-Katrina, um, and when I say that, what I'm speaking about is um, my experiences post-Katrina in working with a number of colleagues who are around here, basically. Um, one, oh, I'm sorry, uh, one very dear friend that a number of you, I believe, know, 
She's no longer with us. Uh, her name is Pam DeShiel. And she and I, at the time when she was living, were very active in our neighborhood association. My eyes are failing me here. <laughs> in our neighborhood association. And also helped establish an entity that is the a co-sponsor of this program today, the Lower Ninth Ward Center for Sustainable Engagement and Development. This slide set here, I'm going to be very brief, I'm going to run through them, it's a lot of slides, but I really want to speak from just a few of these slides. This slide set here I developed uh, for a recent talk that I gave in Tampa, Florida at what's called the Restore America's Estuaries meeting. And the focus of that presentation, that meeting, was on ecosystem restoration and community engagement in that issue. And this system that you see in terms of land, but Lake Bourne, Lake Pontchartrain, and then of course there's that area that you see there, the area of interest, that's the central wetlands area, which part of which is on the northern end of the lower ninth ward, which is basically this area mostly in red there, okay? <clears throat> Now, post-Katrina, once evidence and data and information became very clear to us and it was presented to us as to ultimately what caused the failure of the protection structures, the levees, the flood walls, it was because of the superhighway, as we call it, of the Mississippi River Gulf outlet through which all that storm surge from Hurricane Katrina came crashing into Eastern New Orleans, St. Bernard Parish, and ultimately into the Lower Ninth Ward. Brought all that water into the Industrial Canal, basically, and you know the effect of a hurricane, it's a vacuum effect. It just causes the water to just be pushed in and to all the canals and so forth to just swell up. And with that swelling, that pressure's gotta get off, give off some kind of way, right? I mean, if we, if we know physics, the pressure, the water, it's gotta go somewhere. And so, in our situation, and um, it's believed, I, I don't know for certain, but I do know this, when I got back in my neighborhood, October the 9th, I did see this big ass barge sitting high up on the land. It's <laughs> believed, of course, that that loose barge in that canal, and it shouldn't have been in that canal during that time, but that's another conversation there, and that's something else that we're trying to work on. Um, basically came crashing into that flood wall. And once it came crashing, you know the rest. The water followed, and it followed, and it followed. Um, this just basically, again, is the context from which I'm going to talk habitat restoration and community. And not just habitat restoration, because I know it's not just the focus of this program today. Restoration, planning, and community, community engagement. The role of that in terms of recovering post a disaster. Using it as a tool, a tool, an educational tool. What I mean by that, <clears throat> in our community in Lower Ninth Ward, through uh, one of the crown jewels of, of a school in our city, the Martin Luther King Junior Elementary Charter School, there was this great, and I think it still remains, this infusion of ecology threaded through the curriculum of the students so that the students in, the, in our community have an appreciation, okay, and can begin to value our ecosystem and the benefits and the protections and so forth that it provides our community. Again, we're a community of color, have largely been such for years, so this address of ecosystem restoration and, and proper land management restoration is an environmental justice issue. And of course, the role of traditional ecological knowledge in restoration. We have with us today a dear friend and brother, and he is a premier historian relative to the bayou, Brother John Taylor here. We know him as the Swamp Man or Swamp Red. He's usually stationed out, at a, out on a platform overlooking the bayou, meeting and greeting everyone who comes by to learn about the bayou, okay? So here's an image of that water crashing into that, crashing and I should say through that super highway leading into our communities. The outcome, that's the lower ninth ward. Image, an image that I know you're very familiar with. 
Before Katrina, after Katrina. But now, this is the image I really want to speak from, because it, it basically talks about and illustrates the community engagement. This is an image from one of our planning meetings, or charrettes, as we all call them. Um, we tend to not to like that term. But planning meetings or workshop, in, this was about, I want to say, February, March of 2006. Okay, so just a few months after Katrina. And in this image here, you see me and a number of our residents. At this time, folks, we only had about maybe 50 to 60 of our lower Ninth Ward residents back in the city able to participate. Now, that's 50 to 60 of a pre-Katrina population of a little over 14,000 folks. And we were struggling as to whether or not we put on sessions like this, given the fact we had so few of our people back. But at the same time, if you recall, especially those of you who I know are from this city, if you recall, there was that whole focus of neighborhoods having to prove their viability. So this train was coming through, and Pam and I and others was like, we got to get on this mother, OK? <laughs> because we got, we got to get going on this. So we will have to involve as many of our people as we possibly can find as many people as we possibly can after the fact and inform them about this process. And we took months, even years, I mean, it's a story that's still unfolding, informing our people as to the planning conversations, the planning issues. Thea talked about green development versus just development. It was in this conversation that we were beginning to learn about green development, okay? And at this time, I didn't know much about green development, okay? I know a lot now, and I'm still learning. But there were a lot of folks in this conversation who were like, green development? You know, we didn't say just development, but for the most part, folks were saying, look, like Reverend Edwards was saying, I just need enough money to get the house fixed up to move back in that bad boy, okay? And I got to find a job to sustain all that, and yada, 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 okay? So, you know, there was some tension. But at the end of the day, when Pam and I and others in this picture here walked away from this experience, we said, look, <clears throat> we realize from what we've learned that this green development approach, this long-term sustainable approach, is an approach that we're going to have to take. Why? Because we are coming back to still a vulnerable area of the country. And like Reverend said, you ask the people in New York and New Jersey right now, how many of you think they, how many folks you think will say, or do you think I should say, a whole hell of a lot of folks are going to say, oh, we're just going to write the state of New Jersey off, or write New York, or lower Manhattan off? Hell no. There will be some who might, based on economic reasons, and you know, we know the reasons, but you, I bet you, Bippy, they're going to be a greater majority of folks who are going to say, look, we're going to have to learn from this disaster. We're going to have to learn from it. You know, this is global warming unfolding. We're a coastal community, like us down here. So we're going to have to learn from it. We're going to have to take some steps, take some measures, further inform and educate our people on this approach. And we're going to have to balance it with just development. Because they're going to be those folks, and they still remain, even down here, who can't make the green development leaps because they don't have the monies to do such. Okay. You know, Pam and I used to always say, and our folks still say, whatever measures people can take to become green, that's good, okay? At the end of the day, we want to try to make them as whole as we possibly can. Turn them on to resource, resources, turn them on to expertise, you name it, so they can just get back in the house and then maybe at a later date focus on how to green the thing up, okay? Green up their life, you know? If there's a balance, there's a balance. And of course, in this conversation and many others afterwards, there was the issue of, OK, with this green development, are we going to ultimately price our people out of life down here? OK? And we were, we were very, very careful <clears throat> in making certain that we didn't promote that message. And that's still playing out in Lower Nine and throughout the city, just as I know it is in other cities and communities around the country and the world. You, we don't want to bring something in that prices our people out of life. OK? We've got to strike a balance. You know, not everybody can afford the make it right or global green homes. We realize that. 
which is why our center is focused on, look, what are some resources or expertise or whatever we can offer to our people so that they can do and take whatever measures they can? We don't want people to be priced out, okay? And that's why I should also point out the main focus of that Make It Right project, as well as that Global Green project, has been about focusing on our pre-Katrina Lower Ninth Ward residents first. Don't bring in outsiders just yet. Pre-Katrina folks first. Okay, and we still have debates about that, all right? Because time has gone on and we're seeing fewer and fewer of our people coming back. So this image here, I think is just apropos. <clears throat> it was the beginning of this extensive community engagement that we went through. In fact, it was, it was I'm, I'm, basically the images you're seeing are popping up there are covers of planning documents that we generated. That larger one is the cover of our unified New Orleans planning document. That was a subsequent planning process we went through. That first cover there is the very first planning process that this neighborhood, uh, or one of the first, I should say, that this area went through. And the focus of that was on historic as well as sustainable redevelopment of our Lower Ninth Ward community. <coughs> In fact, I should point out, this good brother sitting right here, David Lee, he was one of our lead, or I should say lead planners in a middle process that is not reflected here in terms of a document cover. We had this process called the Lambert planning process, that city council driven process. Brother Lee here was the planner that worked with us in Lower Nine to go through that process. And when he heard and learned about all the issues that we covered in that first process, I remember you, t you told me and Pam, you said, you know, you all have an excellent foundation here on which I can start my work on your behalf, okay? And we said to him, brother, borrow it liberally, okay? And we'll work with you to make sure we get as many more residents to come through and be involved in that process. So I know I've said it, but I'm going to say it again publicly. Thank you for your work in that regard, all right? <clears throat> and the logo of our center, the focus, on helping our residents, you know, further chart this path of a green, sustainable recovery. But again, a just recovery too, okay? A just recovery as well. And we're one of the leading advocates in our community for further restoration of our ecosystem, the Central Wetlands area and the, the entire uh, river, Pontchartrain, and, and, and Lake Bourne Basin system. Swamp Red himself, okay? That institutional figure. Um, who knows a whole lot of knowledge regarding the bayou and the central wetlands. And he's further helping us bring this information and in, inform our people so that they understand. And, and, and some of them already understand now. He's helped, us, he's helped us further identify folks in the neighborhood who know just as much as he does. I'm going to stop right there. Um, I think you've gotten the gist of what my whole part is about here. Thank you. Good job. While, oh, yeah. While we're transitioning, I'd like to address the question that came up. Is the person still here who asked the question? Someone asked about China. So in the paper, um, I have two citations um, that talk about um, how China and Europe are increasing uh, the transition to the, gr the green transition to energy, uh, renewable energy. It's basically with, by setting targets for non-renewable energy by the year 2020, such things such as solar power. Uh, one of those citations that, I, that are in the paper, the National Research Council in 2011 has an, uh, a report called America's Climate Choices. And the second uh, citation is in a journal called The Mercury uh, from November of 2011 uh, by Akeem Steiner. He has an article called Towards a Green Economy. And so I'd be happy to, to give you that at the end.
be as interesting. Just my luck today, I tell you. Um, to be honest with you, I was asking myself, why are you here? I feel a little bit like uh, Forrest Gump a little bit. You know, when he was just out of place? That's how I feel a little bit. And he just started running and running and running, and he became very successful. So I'm just going to keep running, and hopefully, hopefully I get just as successful. But my name is Matilda Tennessee, and I run a training program called Limitless Vistas. And with our training program, we train inner city youth between the ages of 18 through 29 to become environmental technicians. And I'm going to step this program was started in 2006 by a man named Patrick Barnes, who had a vision to get more African Americans involved in environmental work. He received a contract from the Army Corps at, right after Katrina in Lake Charles. At that time, I was working for Job One on a temporary basis, and a job order came across my desk and it said, pay $1,900 a week. I said, oh, $1,900 a week? So I said, uh, I wonder, is this true? So I got my two boys, my cousins, my nephews from Tennessee. I said, come on, we're going to go. They said, well, Mama, where are we going to sleep? I said, but son, for that kind of money, we could sleep in the car. So true to his word, they were paying $1,900 a week. So both of my sons got on board. He looked at me. He said, I want to open up a nonprofit organization so that I can start training youth for this type of work. He said, do you think you can do that for me? Well, at that time, I didn't have a job. So I said, yes, sir, I think I can do that. Never had opened up a nonprofit before, so I just took, like Forrest Gump, I just took to running. So since that time, we started in 2006, we have trained over 300 students. You'll see on the video that we trained 250. But today, we have trained 300 students. We have issued out $191,000 and scholarship funds for our students to go to any college that they want to, or either they can take that money and pay off their student loans. Let's hope they can. That, de that really deserves a round of applause. What we do is assist young people to complete their education learn the necessary skills to become gainfully employed and become involved in community environmental and construction learning projects. So what we do, we go to our, our communities and we see what's needed and we work in that area. And from working as, in the community, our kids gain job skills. Our training involves a combination of classroom activities on-the-job training, internship and, internship, and mentoring through working with professionals in the industries. Now, we have with us, who, the people who train our students are professional geologists, hydrologists, and environmentalists. Mr. Barnes spared no expense in trying to get our students trained. I really feel like far. I'm lucky. Okay. Which one is it? This one? Which one? That's, that's this? Yes, that's it. Wait, no, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's a. Uh, hold tight, hold tight. Yeah, this is it here. Mm -hmm. I it. Is this it here? Hi. No, what it is. What's it 
called again. So sorry. Okay. All right. Anyway, we provide training programs in the following areas, and I don't have to tell you all what a brownfield site is, what, what a site assessment is. We do brownfield site evaluation, abandoned gas station site assessments, environmental construction, home weatherization, pre and post test energy audits, water and wastewater operations. Our students also receive certifications for 40 hour has whopper, 32 hours asbestos, uh, lead and mold uh, remediation, building and performance analysis, water and wastewater operators and training certifications, and or provisional license. Our students will get their AmeriCorps scholarship, their living allowance, and internship opportunities. Job training and community service learning projects that we do, we have worked with the uh, Sewage and Water Board, the Yolia Water of America. They've also done internships for several uh, environmental companies. So sorry. I'm gonna to talk to you a moment about our water and wastewater training program and then I think I'm gonna to try to wrap it up. Our water and wastewater program, we know for a fact that uh, all across the country that the water and wastewater operators are in demand. They are retiring. We also know that there's gonna be new infrastructure. The problem is, is that they do not have enough people to replace those retirees. So we came up with the idea, why not use our young people? There are career ladder jobs that our young people can take hold to and build upon. So we've had several students to go through an internship program through the Sewage and Water Board and through Veolia Waters of North America. I don't know if you know who Veolia Water North America is, but they're actually a subcontractor to Sewage and Water Board, and they handle all of our wastewater. Uh, some of you may know Veolia as transportation, but they also known for their water works. And so Veolia has hired three or four of our participants as uh, uh, on the job training. They make about $15 an hour. And for someone coming out of high school to get a certificate or to take a, 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 a state test and get on with a major company, I think that's pretty good. We also work with our students with coastal restoration. What I thought Mr. Allen was going to tell you is that soon uh, New Orleans will be receiving probably billions of dollars for coastal restoration from this BP <coughs> oil spill. There are gonna be lots of contractors to come to this city. They're going to need skilled workers. Why not use what we have? Why not train our workers to work in those jobs? Is that possible, Mr. Allen? Why not? have a training program set up to train people to prepare for those jobs that we know that are coming to the city. And then we can more or less compel those contractors who come from out of town to hire locals. Hire our residents, hire our students. We're talking about taking students off the streets. Well, give them something to go to. I am so sorry about this PowerPoint, people. But anyway, I do want to give you a few success stories that we have, and unfortunately, we do not have the pictures. And these success stories is what really motivate me to keep coming, to keep talking. This is not my forte. I don't, I don't like being out 
in the public as happy knows, but this is what keeps me going. I get students every day coming to my office, and some wants to be on the right track and some don't. But it's those kids that have struggled, who may have had babies, who have two or three children, who just want to get off the streets, or who, who just got out of prison and, and want to do better, want a chance, and, and they get in the program and they land a good job. That's what keeps me going. That's what keeps me going. Students who worked over here at the Hyde Regency, making $15.50 an hour. I don't know if anybody knows Leaf Environmental Company. They're actually over here on uh, uh, St. Bernard, over in the St. Bernard on State Street, where they're getting ready to build a new school over there. My student is an environmental technician, and he makes about $2,500 a pay period because he got the skills, because we say, hey, look, if you get this certification, you get your 40 hours has whopper, your DOT uh, uh, has mat, we can put you in these positions. And so for those of you, for those of you who have companies, those of you who know of, of contractors, encourage them to hire our young people. Encourage them to give them an opportunity. And then the other thing that I do need to tell you, we have in our registration kickoff, if you know of any kids between the ages of 18 through 29 that's looking to make a change, have them to come to me, have them to call us. We also, uh, uh, our students get an AmeriCorps scholarship. They also get a stipend as they go along in the training. And then we try to connect them with, with companies to do internships. So I think it's a very fascinating program. I thank you for your time. I'm so sorry about the PowerPoint. It would have added so much justice to what I'm saying. Uh, but if I can be of any assistance to help you push the young people into different uh, uh, career types of opportunities, if we can do the training, we'll be more than happy to assist. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you all um, for your patience out there with, with getting everything together. We appreciate your time and your um, attention to our, our panelists. I want to thank my panelists for doing such an outstanding job. Let's just do a few questions. Um, to put everything in context, uh, we have a great amount of experience here in government, uh, community, academia, and youth. Um, let's focus on the Lower Ninth Ward and talk about the Bayou Bienvenue uh, Wetland Triangle, which in many ways is an urban wetland. It's the city of New Orleans kind of window into wetlands. It's a, uh, a ghost swamp. All three of you all have uh, dynamic uh, experience in the L9. Um, Charles, can you talk about what does it look like um, for that community to interact with habitat restoration, the Bayou Bienvenue, and why that's important moving forward in terms of um, restoration for the, for the area and, and storm protection as well? Well, as I alluded to earlier, in fact, it's even reflected in one of my images, there is this platform, this access platform that we built with the help of a lot of friends and partners from around the country, really, um, to basically make it more accessible uh, for people to stand up on the platform, come out, learn about the bayou, interact with Brother John and, and others. Um, we have a wonderful partnership and relationship with the National Wildlife Federation through Amanda Moore, who's here, as well as you, my friend, Happy, <laughs> to basically put signage out along that area. Um, and some signage is there already, showing images of what the bayou once looked like when it was thriving and flourishing, um, and just basically talking about the history and, and further amplifying the message of the, the values in terms of the ecosystem services and benefits of this ecosystem, um, the flood protection it offers to the neighborhood. Um, there have been numerous meetings because we take advantage of our Holy Cross Neighborhood Association and other groups like that in the lower nine to bring in guest lectures and people offering talks on the ecosystem. And you know, a lot of the people like Brother John know the value already of the system there. Um, in that image that I showed up, that I had displayed earlier, there was a brother in that conversation named Stephen Ringo. Um, I never forget, it was Stephen who was in that conversation. He said to us, she said, you know, well, we're focused on redevelopment and recovery of the land, he said, y'all, we need to focus on recovering the, the bayou. Now, Stephen, and I know he won't mind me saying his age to some degree, he's born in the early 50s, 
Those like myself who came about in 1973 after the MRGO was opened, which was in 65, we don't recall a flourishing teeming bayou, okay? So Stephen is another one who helped us, you know, go back out to that area and realize this, this is necessary, this is important, you know? Um, so there have been those kinds of interactions. And, and then I'm happy to say even with my current job here at the city, um, I'm further linking up with partners such as you and Amanda and, and all of our other environmental NGOs and advocates to further um, advance the cause of restoration. You know we were, involved, we were very much involved in getting language in the state's coastal master plan recently, where right now we've got an authorization for multi-millions of dollars to come to that area. You know, that took a lot of hard work. That took a lot of work that I can thankfully say we started down there in the neighborhood and just further built on it, you know? So I don't mean to be yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, that's great. Uh, earlier, you talked about um, just and verse, green versus just development within the context of, of climate change and more natural disasters, hurricanes, um, and our need to really use renewable resources, recycle goods, kind of reuse, renew, recycle. How do we communicate that message in the Lower Ninth Ward? Um, that's something that um, can be beneficial. I think that's one of the primary goals of the, the Center for Sustainable Engagement and Development, the organization that Charles has been talking about. Um, they've been uh, consistently and continuously since they were founded, uh, providing through uh, community meetings, through um, events, um, through a variety of tours, uh, providing that message for, those, for that community. That community is probably one of the the most well educated on this topic because of the efforts of that group as well as Global Green and many of the other groups that are working down there. There's a concentration of uh, discussion and debate around these topics in the Ninth Ward um, that might be surprising for people outside the region. In fact, when I came here after Katrina myself, I was surprised that the Ninth Ward was the center of discussion about these issues. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, when I went to the Ninth Ward, I met people like Charles and Pam DeShiel and others who told me about this. And I was just surprised that you, you wouldn't think that, but that is the center of it here. So um, I think it's by the, the grassroots organizations um, in collaboration and in solidarity with some of the national organizations that are interested in uh, moving, moving forward with, with just and green sustainability. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Matilda, thank you for doing that. I know you don't like to be on, on the spot, but I appreciate your input. Um, you know, a lot of people look at um, coastal restoration as a future emerging economy with $50 billion. Um, the state is planning to invest in coastal restoration over the next 50 years. You mentioned the Restore Act money that will be coming um, down. We also know that we have to diversify environmental leadership and we have to have more women and minorities involved in that, in that process. Can you talk about what, um, and we also know we have to get jobs for young people, right? We know we're dealing with this rampant crime and I try to connect all of these things together. Can you talk about some experiences of the young people that you work with maybe that are new to expose, new exposing, uh, newly exposed to the bayou or wetlands or just environmental advocacy and, and justice and what that's been like? Well, let me say this first. Uh, we have this motto says that the greatest opportunity coincides with the greatest need. And whenever there is a disaster or whenever there is a, a need like it is in the uh, bayou, there, there is opportunity there. And that opportunity can come, from, come to those residents in that area. When we can start training them for those job skills. I mean, there's going to be a, an array of job skills that will be needed from, from clerical work to, to, to people with PhDs. But you got to know what to do. And somebody has to be able to train them. And so it's going to really take uh, uh, leaders uh, who know how to, leaders who know how to, to, to work in those coastal environments to start training the residents so that we can get those type of jobs. I mean, they're gonna be well-paid paying jobs, so why not go to the locals? Mm -hmm. And I always feel like, um, you know, prior preparation prevents poor performance. I feel like if we know we're gonna have this infusion of money in the future, now is the time to really empower and educate youth to take advantage of this emerging economy. At this time, we'll take two questions from the audience and we'll try to wrap up within uh, 10 minutes. Any questions, anyone? 
Okay. You had a chance. Can I, I just see them. if there's anybody else that has a question? Just to, just to be fair, you got the mic. All right, hold on. Let's let this gentleman ask a question. Can we let him? All right, go ahead, go ahead. I'm ready. Go ahead, baby. Yeah. I think this Matilda, Tennessee, right? That's correct. You were referring to like Dollar 35 High School. That's right, sir. I went by the Campus Street, mm -hmm. Northern Street, That's Canada, right. and Center Street. None That's correct. Was, okay? That being contested, too, because the DEQ, the company that you, the people that you supplied with, a couple of your young brothers, no level. They thought they're not going to be a leadership. They're not going to be with young brothers and sisters going to be leading anybody anyway. Okay? They're going to be on a lower level. The people that you send it over to the, uh, to the site. There's a remediation site back there with the ties to that. Okay? The biggest question back there is the EQ stopped the project for a couple of weeks or so because they weren't doing a good job. And number two, most importantly, there's a playground that they call Willie Hall Playground, adjacent to which was formerly Philip Junior High School. You're talking to somebody who the damn history of New Orleans, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, some folk, some elements in the community trying to eradicate the park and make the whole area a high school. That's, there's a fight back. With the other word, make a long story short. Just because one person say one thing on one hand, understand there's other dynamics going on. And that, that area is being contested technically for the, not doing a good job. That company that's supposed to be so great doing a good job. They, they say, well, y'all didn't do the job clean enough. So that's delayed the school. And, and also delayed because the community fight the issue about they want their park to remain where it's at. <coughs> right. Thank you so very much. And I'm fully aware of environmental justice issues. My point was that, you know, I'm just trying to connect the young people to the job sites. And DEQ, I've been involved in with DEQ and what have you, but all I want to do is make sure that our young people that live in that area work. If it's got to be have work done, why not let our young people work? I've talked to them. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. I've talked to them that you have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Any other questions? Great. Thank you guys so much. We'll take a break, uh, maybe a two or three minute break, and then we'll have the opening the city uh, panel up. All right. Thank you very much.